Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is The Workhouse and the Unwanted. Where little remains of many aspects of famine-era Ireland, the crumbling ruins of workhouses are the most visible reminders of the horrors of the Great Famine in the Irish landscape. These bleak institutions became the primary source of famine relief in Ireland from September 1847 onwards and they quickly became overwhelmed as the unwanted in Irish society, the starving poor with nowhere else to turn, flocked to their doors. The cramped and filthy conditions inside were appalling and by the time the Great Famine had run its course, over 300,000 Irish people have perished within the walls of these buildings. This podcast is their story. Very few people are born unwanted, but by December 1847, Ireland's workhouses were full of such people. Each of them had their own story about how they had found themselves in this position. While there are too many to tell, this podcast opens by following one family whose misfortune saw them join the ranks of the unwanted. So, the show begins in the northwest of Ireland in County Leitrim. Then, the episode takes an unconventional look at workhouses by focusing on the bitter, and sometimes violent struggle for control of the running of these institutions, which in many ways explains why so many died in them. The Patron's Guide for this episode is available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and has maps and pictures of workhouses and links to numerous resources online. You can get this by becoming a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Before we begin, I want to thank everyone who has been in touch over the last few weeks. I am getting a lot of correspondence through email, Facebook and Twitter these days. I try to get back to everyone, but it can take weeks, sometimes longer. So I will ask you to bear with me, folks. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you who have become patrons of the show at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. This series is only possible through your support. Throughout the series, I am thanking each and every patron, and today I want to give the following listeners a shout out. Mary Lynch, John A.C. McGowan, Paul Christian Osterberg, Kathleen Cronin, Sean Pike, Zach Wambold, Robert Hepburn, Paul O'Neill, Michael Bushert, Shane Gray, Jeanette Marie Culver, Benny Poon and Emmett Monaghan. There were few counties in Ireland hit harder by the Great Famine than Leitrim. In 1841, the population of the county stood at 155,000 people. Ten years later, as the Great Hunger was drawing to a close, it had fallen by 28%, standing at 112,000. Whole villages were depopulated. Life was changed forever. While emigration would continue to be a drain on the Irish population, Leitrim hemorrhaged people. By 1997, 150 years after the worst year of the Great Famine, only 25,000 people were living in the county, scarcely one-sixth of the 1841 population. While Leitrim's history since the Great Famine is clearly one interwoven with emigration, this process was underway as early as 1846. In that second year of the Great Hunger, when the potato crop was almost completely destroyed by blight, many who could no longer survive in their native county made the decision to leave in search of a better life elsewhere. Among these emigrants was Thomas Dignan, his wife and four children. Originally from the hinterland of Balnamore, a town close to the modern border that divides the Republic from Northern Ireland, they took flight in the hope of finding a better life, or one that was at the very least sustainable. Their journey, like that of so many other migrants, would lead them in an unpredictable direction. Indeed, they'd probably never have left had they known what lay ahead. Although many Irish emigrants would head to the USA, the Dignans only got as far as England, perhaps an indication they were too poor to afford the more expensive transatlantic voyage. They eventually settled in Rochdale, a city to the northwest of the port of Liverpool, where most Irish emigrants landed. In Rochdale, Thomas Dignan was able to find work and the family rented a cellar in the city, While they were financially better off, they were by no means secure and their children had to beg on the streets. Life was not easy. One of their sons, the 12-year-old Michael Dignan, had poor health, suffering from epileptic seizures. However, 
Initially, at least, English society was sympathetic to the plight of Irish famine refugees. An appeal from Queen Victoria to relieve the famine back in Ireland in March 1847 had raised a considerable amount of money, £170,000 from the public. However, in the following six months, things began to change. The Dignans and many others like them would soon find themselves unwanted in England as what has been dubbed famine fatigue set in. This was basically a change in attitudes among the English public around 1847. As a recession hit England that year, many English people felt they and their government had paid enough to Ireland. This attitude was hardened by the arrival of thousands of Irish refugees in English ports. For people like the Dignans, life in England was only going to get more difficult. By late 1847, sympathy was diminishing fast. When Queen Victoria launched another appeal in October that year, it only raised £30,000, just over one-sixth of what had been raised a few months earlier. Indeed, the Times newspaper had gone as far as to actually come out publicly against giving charity to Ireland and call for any money raised to be given to the English poor instead. In spite of this growing antipathy, it initially seems the Dignans had escaped a worse fate back in Ireland. They had left just before what proved to be one of the worst periods of the Great Famine. 3% of the pre-famine population of County Leitrim perished from famine and disease in 1847 alone. However, in what was a cruel twist of irony, having escaped these horrors back in Ireland, the Dignan family were struck down with fever in the summer of 1847. Thomas and his wife, with their two sons, Patrick and Michael, and one of their daughters, were all admitted to a local fever hospital in Rochdale. Around August the 1st, the parents, Thomas Dignan and his wife, succumbed to fever, leaving their four children to fend for themselves. The two girls, whose names are not recorded, went to the local workhouse where the youngest, only a baby of about 12 months, died shortly afterwards. Her older sister remained in Rochdale Workhouse, now on her own. Of the two boys in the fever hospital, the eldest, Patrick, aged only 14, was discharged after doctors were happy he did not in fact have fever. His younger brother Michael, however, was not so lucky and he faced a three-week battle against the disease that had already killed his parents. But eventually he pulled through. Nonetheless, the family dreams of building a better life overseas were crushed and despite their terrible plight, the orphan children found little sympathy in Rochdale. The authorities were unwilling to care for the sickly Michael Dignan for a moment longer than they had to and he was discharged from the hospital on September the 1st, 1847, even though he was still severely weakened by his battle with fever. Pauperised and dependent on public welfare, he and his older brother, the 14-year-old Patrick Dignan, were unwanted in Rochdale. Many viewed Irish orphans like them as little more than leeches. Indeed, even before Michael had been released from his hospital bed, plans were afoot to pack the two boys back to Ireland. Provisions in law allowed for Irish paupers to be deported to Ireland unless they were resident in a jurisdiction in England for five years or more. With their parents dead, the Dignans were immediately singled out for deportation. On the very day Michael Dignan was discharged from hospital, he and his older brother Patrick were taken straight to Rochdale train station. From there, they were sent to the port of Liverpool to be shipped back to Ireland. When they reached Liverpool, the situation on the docks was nothing short of chaotic. The boat to take them to Ireland was the steamship, the Duchess of Kent. Huge numbers were waiting with over 500 people queuing on docks. Most were seasonal labourers who had come to England to work on the harvest and were now returning home. But 40 were paupers like the Dignans being shipped back to Ireland for no other reason than they were poor. They were unwanted no matter where they went. Having no future back home, they had fled famine, but now they found themselves being deported from England. Even on board ship, these people were treated abominably. With no room in the cabins or even in the sheltered parts of the ship, the paupers had to stand on deck on the vessel. Even when a storm blew up as the boat crossed the Irish Sea, little was done for them. During a voyage that would take 22 hours, the conditions were deplorable. Patrick and Michael Dignan, along with many others, were left on deck as the ship battled through heavy seas. Soaked through, Patrick would later recall that the seas were so high they were nearly swimming on deck. Rumours abounded that a woman and child had been washed overboard, but no one even seemed to know exactly how many people were on board because this couldn't be verified one way or another. 
Eventually, as morning broke over the ship, sailors offered the boys cloth to shelter under, but it was too late. The condition of the younger of the brothers, Michael Dignan, a sickly child at the best of times, had deteriorated. Alerted to this state, the captain eventually brought the boy into the cookhouse on the ship to resuscitate him in the heat from the cookers. The captain then left, but when he returned, five minutes later, Michael Dignan had died. The steamship, the Duchess of Kent, finally arrived in the North Wall docks in Dublin port at 1.30pm on September the 2nd, 1847. What had been a 22-hour voyage had proved costly. Michael Dignan was not the only casualty. Another man on board who could not be identified, but was almost certainly another pauper, had also died. When word circulated through Dublin about what had happened, the incident caused consternation in the city. Inquests into the deaths were held, during which the older surviving brother, Patrick, testified about what had happened to his younger brother, about how he had been discharged from the fever hospital and then shipped home. Officials in Dublin rallied against the heartless actions of their counterparts in Rochdale who had put the sickly Michael Dignan through such a gruelling journey. However, the story was by no means unusual. In that year of 1847 alone, Patrick and Michael Dignan were just two of 15,000 Irish famine refugees deported back to Ireland from England. If ever there was an indication that being poor and Irish meant you were unwanted in the world, this was it. The Cork Examiner commented on the hypocrisy of this situation given Ireland and Britain were supposedly the same country in the United Kingdom. We are told that both countries are one and inseparable while the people of this unhappy land are driven from the shores of England as soon as they are stricken with poverty or disease. The Freeman's Journal changed an old rhyme that had been about paupers to read Rattle his bones over the stones, he's only a paddy whom nobody owns. In Dublin, where the press and authorities in the city called for inquiries, this offered the 14-year-old Patrick Dignan little comfort. His hopes and dreams were destroyed. He had fled famine in Ireland only a year previously with three siblings and two parents. They were all dead, save his last surviving sister, but she was back in Rochdale workhouse. He was alone in an Ireland where his story was just one of tens of thousands, indeed hundreds of thousands of people who were all unwanted. They could not afford to buy food and face starvation. Unable to emigrate because they had no money, they had few options now in Ireland, a land that seemed doomed. Records indicate that Patrick Dignan did not enter any institution in Dublin and by September the 16th, 1847, he had left the city. While the historical record runs cold at this point, it seems likely he returned to Leitrim where he still had an uncle living. There was almost nowhere else for this boy to go. As I have said, emigration was out of the question given he didn't have the means. Further to this, even begging had been made illegal by this point under a law instituted earlier in 1847 and it now carried a sentence of 30 days hard labour. In this context, it appears Leitrim was Patrick's only option. However, what awaited him there was not really an improvement. Poverty and starvation was rampant, something he knew only too well. He had, after all, tried to escape it. In reality, there was only one option, the workhouse, which brought with it terrible danger. Having left Dublin in autumn 1847, Patrick Dignan would have faced a journey through an Ireland gripped by a deepening sense of anxiety as he returned to Leitrim. Another year of famine had come and gone since he had left and a third bad harvest in that year of 1847 had left the population without hope. The worries this inflicted were compounded by major changes in the way the British government was planning famine relief. Soup kitchens, which had proved to be so effective, were being shut down in September of the year. The main source of aid from September onwards was what were known as poor law unions. These were the social welfare services of the day and they were not designed to handle crisis poverty. They are best known because each union contained a workhouse where the destitute poor could receive food and shelter. When they were made responsible for all famine relief in 1847, the remit of these poor law unions had to be massively expanded. Workhouses, after all, could only accommodate around 100,000 people, so the unions were permitted to dispense outdoor relief, that is, to open their own soup kitchens or dole out blankets to the destitute still living in their own homes. However, for Patrick Dignan in 1847, the prospect of becoming reliant on poor law unions for survival 
was pretty terrifying. While they varied hugely, I want to look specifically at one union that Patrick Dignan probably returned to, that is Mohill in South Leitrim, where he had an uncle living. Although the boundaries would later be changed, the Mohill Poor Law Union in 1847 covered a large part of South County Leitrim, stretching from the town of Mohill north to Balnamore, where the Dignans had originally lived. All in all, around 70,000 people fell under its jurisdiction, but the workhouse was situated in the town of Mohill. The likelihood is that Patrick Dignan, on returning to Leitrim, would have found himself inside Mohill workhouse very quickly, given his relative, his uncle, was already destitute and probably couldn't have supported the child. Entering such an institution would have been unnerving, to say the least. Mohill workhouse had never been anything other than shambolic. For its first three years in operation, before the onset of the Great Famine, it had never been more than half full, but even then it was constantly surrounded by controversy. To say the administrators were inept was an understatement. The Board of Guardians who oversaw the running of the building did not take their work seriously. Meetings were frequently postponed because members failed to turn up. The financial position of the Poor Law Union and its workhouse were also a disaster long before the Great Famine. Each poor law union and its corresponding workhouse were funded by a local tax called a poor rate. However, in Mohill, officials struggled to collect the levy. Within months of opening, the local banks were already refusing to give the workhouse credit because of its finances, or lack of them. While corruption played its part with tax collectors keeping the money themselves, there was a more systematic problem. As we will see later in the show, many of those liable to pay the tax simply couldn't afford it. In short then, long before the Great Famine, the Mohill Poor Law Union and its workhouse were highly dysfunctional. Once the famine set in and increasing numbers became destitute, the situation only deteriorated. While Patrick Dignan only arrived back in Leitrim in late 1847, the building was notorious long before that. As the numbers in the workhouse increased through 1846, deadly diseases such as typhus and typhoid found the increasingly crowded and dirty living conditions inside the workhouse ideal breeding grounds. By February 1847, fever and dysentery had broken out in Mohill workhouse. Over 400 people died in the building between April and June 1847, a death rate that averaged out at over 30 a week. Faced with such an overwhelming death rate and given funds were extremely limited, the boards of guardians dispensed with individual coffins for the dead, which were costing £6 per month. Instead, the bodies were brought, three, in a special box to a field the workhouse had purchased. Then the box, which had been fitted with a removable bottom, opened and the corpses were dumped into a pit. The board of guardians had justified their actions with the words, It's more advisable to feed the living than provide coffins for the dead. It was this workhouse then that Patrick Dignan most likely ended up in after he left Dublin in September 1847. On approaching the building, its appearance told Patrick everything he needed to know about life inside. It looked like something from a war zone which had suffered bomb damage. An inspector later in 1847 would recall, All the dormitories, day rooms, school rooms and wards are open to the weather. Through a number of large holes broken in the walls during the time the house was ravaged by fever. No provisions had been made for repairing or inserting windows and much of the glass is broken. Given they could not even afford proper burials, there was no money available to repair these holes in the walls which had functioned as a crude ventilation system during the summer when fever had raged in the building. While Patrick Dignan's story was poignant, inside Mohill Workhouse, sympathy would have been in short supply. Everyone had their own tragic journey that left them with no choice but to turn to the workhouse. The Great Famine, now in its third year, was impoverishing greater numbers of people every day and leaving them with little choice other than the workhouse. While I will cover evictions in greater detail in coming episodes, I want to recall one eviction that took place in South Leitrim, not far from Mohill, which will give a sense of the hardship and misfortune people were enduring. As I say, Patrick Dignan was by no means the only unwanted person in Ireland in 1847. There were hundreds around Mohill alone. One such person who probably ended up in the workhouse was John Quinn, who had been born way back in 1760. Quinn lived in a village on the estate of William Ormsby Gore at Carrigallon, County Leitrim. Ormsby Gore rarely came to the county. He was the MP for Shropshire in England 
where he resided in a huge mansion called Brighton Hall. By 1847, due to the famine, Quinn and many other tenants had fallen three years behind in their rent. When threatened with eviction, the tenants raised one year's rent as a substantial gesture of goodwill. The offer, however, was rejected. In a sign of things to come, Ormsby Gore's agent made it clear he would not be taking any rent from tenants with less than 20 acres of land, people he deemed unprofitable. Therefore, as winter approached, 11 small tenants, including the 87-year-old John Quinn, were thrown out of their houses, which were then burned before their eyes to stop them being reoccupied. One of the tenants encapsulated the tragedy. We all lived in peace in this village. We were never at law with each other. Our forefathers lived here for generations past. You would say if you saw it before this room came that it was a nice little village. For John Quinn, at the age of 87, he knew of nothing or nowhere else, having lived in the village all his life. People like him had little choice other than the workhouse. In the face of such stories, Patrick Dignan's recent past just melted into a tapestry of human hardship. Indeed, many workhouses contained a cohort of what can only be described as the living dead. Those who had given up all hope and knowing they were going to die, entered the workhouse just so they would receive some kind of burial rather than die alone and unceremoniously along the roadside. With miserable pasts behind them, the prospective future for those inside the workhouse was scarcely better. Mohill workhouse authorities could barely feed those who took refuge inside its walls. Its financial situation, which had always been bad, was disastrous by September 1847. Merchants would now only sell them provisions for cash. No one would extend the workhouse any credit. But in the closing months of 1847, the guardians eventually refused entry to any more people because they didn't have the money to feed them. Eventually, officials in Dublin who oversaw the running of the entire poor law system took steps to intervene at Mohill given it was utterly shambolic. They sent a former army major to investigate the conditions on the ground. His reports illustrate the problems in the workhouse. While disease was not as rampant as it had been earlier in the year, the building was nothing short of horrific. The complex was ruinous despite only being seven years old. The drains didn't work, the kitchen boilers were broken and the account books hadn't been balanced in two years. In December, the large holes in the walls still remained. Furthermore, mealtimes were not controlled and the inspector wondered if theft of food explained the disproportionately high death rate among the young. While some of the officials could be blamed, it is important to note many were conscientious and tried to do what they could despite the overall conditions. It would not be fair to talk about Mohill Workhouse without mentioning the apothecary Dr Soden who paid the ultimate price in his service to the poor when he died from disease in May 1847. Faced with the reports from the inspector of the chaotic situation in Mohill Workhouse, Officials in Dublin eventually took drastic action and dismissed the Board of Guardians in December 1847, replacing them with two paid vice guardians. If Patrick Dignan survived this long, by no means a certainty, he and others inside the walls would see conditions improve somewhat. The new administrators, trusted by government officials, were able to secure loans of money to keep the building running. They were also able to put an end to the horrific burial practices of dumping bodies in a pit. However, competent officials or not, there was no way to solve some of the problems facing Mohill Workhouse and Poor Law Union. A report indicated one of the reasons the workhouse was so financially troubled was the extreme poverty of the district which is retrograding still further each day, which meant many could not afford to pay the taxes to finance the institution. This was a problem inherent in the entire system of poor law unions right across Ireland. Many could not afford to handle the soaring costs of famine relief. This is painfully obvious when we look at other workhouses in the next part of the show. Indeed, there was scarcely any workhouse in Ireland without its own problems. But first, we'll take a break. Experiences of an individual such as Patrick Dignan, who found themselves with nowhere left to turn than the harsh realities of the workhouse, is tragic but representative of hundreds of thousands of people across Ireland by late 1847. While Mohill has given us insights into one workhouse and poor law union, it was somewhat exceptional, given it was so dysfunctional 
Many of the 130 workhouses across Ireland were better run, but the experiences of the so-called inmates was all too often still not much better than that of Mohill. While each poor law union was different, many were hamstrung by chronic financial problems. No matter where you went in Ireland in the late 1840s, workhouses were dangerous and difficult. Writers such as Charles Dickens have often laid the blame on heartless or cruel officials, and while the stereotype was not without some basis, the bigger problem was how the organisations that ran the workhouses were structured. The root of the problem lay in the fact that the structure pitted various groups in Irish society against each other over who should fund the institutions, leading to a bitter and at times violent struggle. It was akin to a deadly game of pass the parcel where various factions in society did what they could to get someone else to foot the bill for famine relief. The loser in this struggle was unquestionably the starving poor inside the workhouses because ultimately no one wanted to pay for their survival. This struggle began in earnest in late 1847 when the British government, as we saw earlier and in previous episodes, closed their soup kitchens and passed famine relief into the hands of individual poor law unions. This now meant that Irish society was going to foot the bill of famine relief because poor law unions were funded through local taxes called poor rates. Now from a distance this might have seemed to have a silver lining. At least it was passing control of famine relief into the hands of Irish people for the first time because Once poor law unions were responsible, this meant that their individual governing boards, called boards of guardians, which were elected by the Irish people, could set the poor rate or tax they collected and ultimately decide how much they spent on the poor in their jurisdiction. However, Irish people, by the nature of their nationality, were not inevitably sympathetic to the starving, and as we shall see, some couldn't afford to be. Class rather than nationality proved a far more important factor. Indeed, passing control of famine relief into Irish society only served to reveal the ruinous state of the island and the deep tensions within Ireland. These tensions can be understood by looking at the board of guardians who governed the poor law unions. On average, each board comprised of 20 to 30 members, some larger, some smaller. The majority of the members were elected but not paid for their time. Even long before they were made responsible for famine relief, their work was unpleasant to say the least, so you might wonder why anyone would voluntarily put themselves forward for such a position. Nevertheless, the boards of guardians in the mid-19th century were often populated by influential men of the day. This was because these boards controlled how much was spent in workhouses and in turn dictated how high the poor rate or local tax collected to run the institution was. Therefore, the rich took an interest in the elections of boards of guardians, not because they were interested in spending money on the poor, but precisely the opposite. They wanted to control the boards to ensure they spent as little as possible. This contributed to mismanagement in general, as boards of guardians were often not particularly interested in the day-to-day running of workhouses or the business of poor relief. This was seen at Mohill, where the attendance rate of meetings of the guardians was atrocious, save when one item in particular was on the agenda, that was money. When these boards who oversaw the running of workhouses were made responsible for famine relief in 1847, some, it should be admitted, did step up to the challenge, but many were a total disaster given their motives. Perhaps the most notorious example was that of Burr, County Offaly. There, the Earl of Ross, who lived in Burr Castle, exerted huge influence over the local board of guardians. He used this influence to stop the expansion of famine relief measures, which led to chronic overcrowding in the local workhouse. By 1849, the building, designed to hold 1,700 people, contained over 3,000 people there was an inevitable human cost. The death rate in Burr Workhouse for many illnesses was several times higher than average. Further to this, they paid extremely low wages, which led to the staff having to steal food from the inmates. Now, while this was an extreme case, many boards of guardians did seek to keep costs down, which had an impact on living conditions in the workhouses. 
While this undoubtedly contributed to the often dire situation prevalent in Irish workhouses, the Board of Guardians were not the only problem by any means. While the British government had handed over famine relief to the poor law unions, it didn't relinquish all control because they too had their own selfish interest in how the Board of Guardians operated. As we saw in previous episodes, the British government had organised several relief programmes in 1846 and early 1847, but the money for these programmes had always only been loans, which were expected to be repaid from poor rates collected by Boards of Guardians. While the British government would write off half the overall amount owed, they insisted the rest would be paid and would not countenance waiting until the famine had run its course. Therefore, as 1848 rolled around, they were intent on getting their money, even if Ireland was still starving. For this reason, the British government wanted boards of guardians to impose high poor rates on their local areas. It was these competing interests, the British government on the one hand who wanted high poor rates and the boards of guardians who wanted to pay low poor rates that framed what became an increasingly bitter dispute over famine relief in Ireland from late 1847 onwards. Neither of these powerful players were necessarily looking out for the starving poor and this contributed to appalling conditions in workhouses. Disputes between the two over money would eventually see the British government dissolve the boards of guardians in numerous unions and replace them with paid officials. Now while some boards were dissolved for good reason, like Mohill for example, which was utterly incompetent, in many cases money was at the heart of the disputes. For example, the first board of guardians to be dissolved was that of Lotherstown, known as Irvinstown today in County Fermanagh in Ulster. The reason for their dismissal was not their failure to carry out famine relief, but instead their refusal to collect poor rates at the level the government demanded. The board, unsurprisingly, wanted to collect lower rates. While the government showed little interest in the starving, the correspondence from the boards of guardians at Lotherstown around their dismissal showed they had little interest in those suffering from famine either. In January 1848, one of the Lotherstown guardians complained about the activities of the paid officials appointed to run the union in their place. Rather than complain that these officials were not doing enough in terms of famine relief, one guardian argued the opposite, that they were spending too much. He singled out the case of a stonemason called John Muldoon. Muldoon had been injured in an accident and couldn't work, yet the old guardians who had been dissolved tried to argue that he could and didn't deserve relief. While boards of guardians, like that of Lotherstown, frequently represented powerful interests in Irish society, and their opposition to paying poor rates is hard to justify, given they had more resources than most, the picture does become more complex when we look at other groups in Irish society who mounted serious resistance to paying for famine relief. You see, everyone with a land holding, valued at over £4 or more, was eligible to pay poor rates. However, by late 1847, the famine and the economic catastrophe that it had unleashed on Ireland was impoverishing many who would once have never imagined they might find themselves reliant on the workhouse. It is understandable, therefore, that many of these people resisted paying poor rates to fund famine relief. Ultimately, the British government's insistence that these people pay what were often high poor rates was actually forcing them to the workhouse door. This was summarised by a journalist in the Cork Examiner who wrote, This will force them to build more workhouses and so their infamous misgovernment will operate in a dreadfully aggravated circle of devastation. In some parts of the country where many did not have the money to pay, they resisted in any way they could. For example, James Flanagan, one of the tax collectors in the Ballyshannon Poor Law Union, received a threatening letter warning him to not try and collect poor rates in the area. He can have been left in little doubt when the letter was signed off with a coffin and the following words, James Flanagan, there is your doom, so if you like it, continue. In that same region, Flanagan received another letter threatening to assassinate him before asking him, do you think we will give you all our little support in rates and leave our families starving. Similar situations could be seen across the country. At Lotherstown in County Fermanagh, the rate collectors had to be accompanied by soldiers, as they did in Kenmare, County Kerry. 
While this resistance is completely understandable, the activities of the British government and the boards of guardians are much harder to justify. Tragically, those already in workhouses had almost no leverage in this situation. No one, rich or poor, wanted to pay for famine relief and the conditions, as I've said previously, in the workhouses grew increasingly dire. Furthermore, rigid adherence to laws which dictated how these workhouses operated inflicted unnecessary misery on the starving poor that took refuge inside these institutions. The most cruel aspect of this was seen when the workhouses approached capacity. When there was no more room in workhouses, Irish poor law unions were allowed to give what was known as outdoor relief. That's opening up soup kitchens and the like. But this was strictly controlled. First, the workhouse had to be full And secondly, they had to seek permission from government officials. There was also another snag, a sting in the tail if you will. Officials obsessed with the idea that many of the poor were simply too lazy to work demanded that workhouses had to be full of what were deemed able-bodied paupers. They believed that the misery of the workhouse would act as a deterrent for those simply too lazy to work. To achieve this, Any old, mentally unwell or physically ill people had to be removed from the workhouse first to create space for these able-bodied paupers. These misfortunates would then be put on outdoor relief. Now this created chaos. The elderly and the sick didn't want to leave the workhouses. Many of them had nowhere else to go. That's exactly why they were in these buildings. On the other hand, the able-bodied did not want to enter the workhouses. They would have much preferred to receive outdoor relief and avoid what they considered the shame and stigma of these institutions. Nevertheless, officials pushed ahead with the policy, but it led to at least one attempted murder. On November 13th, 1847, the chairman of the Nina Board of Guardians, Richard Bailey, was attacked as he returned home. He was shot from behind a wall and the bullet entered his mouth shattered his jaw and teeth before exiting through the other side of his face. The precise reason for the attempted assassination was his insistence that a crowd of people who had turned up at the workhouse seeking help must be admitted to the institution rather than be given outdoor relief. Somewhat miraculously, Richard Bailey survived this attempted assassination. A girl and six men were arrested but I could find no evidence of a trial. While this is the most extreme case of its kind, the general shift of famine relief to poor law unions made them the focus of famine resistance from 1847 onwards. As early as October the 18th, a crowd of 3,000 people turned up at Rathkeel Workhouse as the Board of Guardians were meeting. When they were refused entry, they broke into the institution until eventually they were driven back by the British Army. A Captain Bartlett suffered a fractured skull while one of the protesters suffered a bayonet wound. Only the presence of clerics calmed the situation. In the coming five weeks, similar events took place at Cantark in County Cork and Kilrush in Clare. In November 1847, a large crowd attacked the workhouse of Tralee during a Board of Guardians meeting. They were armed with bludgeons and overpowered six policemen who were present. They were only driven back when several of the Guardians got involved in the fracas. From that day forth, the guardians of Tralee demanded soldiers be present to defend all their meetings. As the new year of 1848 opened, it was clear that the transfer of relief to the boards of guardians was not going to work as a solution to the increasingly dire conditions in Ireland. But this had been entirely predictable. Poor law unions were not set up to deal with huge numbers of people who found themselves utterly destitute by 1847. Furthermore, trying to get Irish society to fund this famine relief was disastrous. The country was clearly on its knees. The previous government of Sir Robert Peel, which had fallen from power in 1846, had acknowledged the weakness of the poor law system for famine relief and had not used it for this very reason. Ultimately, responsibility lay with the British Liberal government. By 1847, they wanted to wash their hands of the entire issue of famine relief and the poor law unions proved a neat and tidy dumping ground. But this was inevitably always going to lead to a catastrophic outcome. It also showed deep rifts in Irish society that were never far from the surface, even in the best of times. Landlords believing the poor were not their responsibility, or in some cases who did not have the money, were not going to pay for famine relief. Smaller tenants who could never afford to pay without totally impoverishing themselves were always going to resist paying the poor rates. This show has covered 
what I have felt are some forgotten aspects of life in workhouses in Ireland. There is a Patrons podcast on workhouses and the poor law in general. This is available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's where I'm going to leave this show for this time. Next up, I'm going to look at the turbulent history of evictions in Ireland, which began in earnest in the closing months of 1847. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>